Hello everyone and once again thank you for being there and welcome to number 15 in my series of talks about the history of English detective fiction from 1920 to about 1960. Tonight I want to look at England's capital, London, and how many authors have used its presence during the 1930s especially, and how that context changed in the post-war years. But first, a few minutes fun with street geography. The most important detective address in London is, of course, 221B Baker Street, although Sherlock Holmes and Dr Watson more properly belong to an earlier period. If we halve 221B, we could arrive at 110A, and in Piccadilly, that's the address of Lord Peter Whimsey and his partner in crime, the ever-reliable Bunter. Before we leave Piccadilly, we might want to search, in vain I'm afraid, for Bottle Street Police Station, and next door is the home of Marjorie Allingham's Albert Campion. We could also look for Whitehaven Mansions, spelt variously, where we could meet Hercule Poirot. However, as we look more closely at the genre, we find that these famous London detectives concluded many of their most famous cases not in London, but in the provinces. Yes, Dorothy L. Sayers provides some excellent pictures of the London club life, the advertising and commercial world and the social network of Whimsy's class. But I don't think we identify with Whimsy, Poirot and Campion with London in the same way that we think of Holmes, for example. Even Inspector French, that stalwart of the Met, from the pen of the genre's top performer, Freeman Wills Croft, ached to get away from London and was always happy to investigate beyond the junctions of the provincial branch lines. Things were to change after 1945 and I will discuss that later. Now that's not to say that great detective novels could not be set in London. An early thriller was John Buchan's The Powerhouse where he demonstrated how the streets of the capital might quickly become enemy territory. And the books do seem to work best when London, the home and friend, becomes something of a threat. Marjorie Allingham's Tiger in the Smoke and Christiana Brand's A London Particular both show how much the London fog can be used to portray a scary city. Now, I've always been interested in how writers of detective novels in the 1930s frequently use the off-stage presence of the capital. It was an essential element in drawing the picture of the quiet parish where nothing ever changes except for the location of this year's body. Where murders happen in the provinces and in the village, and that's where we find many of our bodies, London developed an important role in justifying the idea of a closed and relatively cut-off community beyond the reach of Big Ben. Put another way, Mayhem Parva never existed, of course, but while London remained, we felt more comfortable when we allowed the writer to get away with that rural portrait. London became a place to disappear to. When it was necessary for a witness or a suspect to be out of the way at a particular moment in the story, a mysterious trip to London, often to see a doctor or a solicitor, became a convenient curtain to draw across the immediate proceedings. Agatha Christie used this more than once, but especially effectively in Murder in the Vicarage, where the vicar's wife is absent from the rectory and unaccountable at the time of the murder. We quickly become suspicious of her alibi that she had been in London for the day. Oh yes, we are quickly alert when it comes to a delayed London train. And it is only at the end of the story that we learn that her absence is not only explained, but is shown to have been an especially tasty red herring underpinning a rather nice subplot. I hope I haven't spoiled things here. 
There are many other examples of this technique. London also serves as the model of authority for the country parishes. London makes the laws, of course. Not only do the best detectives come down from Scotland Yard, but London is also a place to visit when we need to consult newspaper archives. Always useful, Mrs McGinty's dead. Or to dig up documentation for family history, the 450 from Paddington, and of course, the will. In these circumstances, where murder in a village is a case of the world gone wrong, Mistress London reassures us that she has the resources, opportunity and clout not only to stop society at large crumbling into the channel, but also to offer a hand at putting things right again. The cosy mystery implies a closed circle, where the detective needs to employ flair and detective thinking to solve the murder. London provides a touchstone that stops that fictional world degenerating into red-faced fantasy. So this notion of a remote but powerful London adds an important strength to the cosy village mystery, providing enduring stability while emphasising the remoteness of living in the sticks. The wall changed much to do with our genre. I will discuss those changes more deeply in a future episode. Population was more mobile, families brought cars, and London could not be presented as being so remote, although many authors still use that context to give their stories a period feel, Nio Marsh and Agatha Christie, for example. But the new post-war authors wanted to explore new policing methods, and that meant including London's Metropolitan Police. Enter John Creasy. He, more than any other writer, brought 1950s London to life in detective books featuring Commander Gideon as J.J. Merrick and, my favourite, Inspector Roger West. And so London moved on from his pre-war role. Of course, the villagers and the capital moved on together. They always will. But we don't have to believe that if we don't want to. As we read again those classics from the Golden Age, London's place in the scheme of things seems just as quaint and old world as the villages that it was protecting. How nice it is. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to episode 15 in my series of talks about the history of English detective fiction. My name is Malcolm Noble. My website is malcolmnoble.com. I hope you'll take a look at it. The podcast page on that website includes a list of previous episodes with links if you wish to catch up. I need to thank Freeze Effects for the royalty-free music and thank you, especially if you are following the episodes. I hope that you will join in with those enthusiastic and very keen-eared listeners who have been in touch. As I've said before, I didn't expect the podcast to get the number of listeners that it does over the different platforms. I've posted this podcast on the 16th of May and will upload the next one on the 1st of June. I hope that you'll be there to listen. In the meantime, all that remains is for me to wish you good night and God bless.